we've got 10 participants. Um, I had a look at some of the, the work that Michael and always shared in terms of the, um, um, the prediction uh, model. And um, there's been some work on the time series analysis by um, Sharwan. And I haven't had a good look at it yet. I haven't had the, uh, the time. Oasis, his, his channel is Delete Laws, and Laws is spelled A, A L A W Z. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's been a crazy one. But yeah, we've, we've had some, some great, um, great work done, and I'm very happy with the progress that we've made for the model development. Um, and you know, I, we're going to share this um, this information um, now, when we can take a look at all the code and see what we what we're doing. The next phase is the model development. Uh, sorry, not the model development, the model deployments. And all along, we've been thinking of um, you know, do, using Streamlit to host the model, the predictive model, and also create you know a number of pages which will be a, a dashboard. Um, and we can share with everyone our insights from the vehicle analysis, the EDA from the model building analysis. Um, we, we haven't had much movement on the geospatial um, instance, but I can do that. That's not a problem. I can pick that up um, and I will you know, make a couple of, of, of different um, sort of plots that, we, that can go into the Streamlit app. And also, of course, we can have a... a prediction model hosted on stream lit as well um and you know i think the best way we could do that is to make the stream lit app accept batch um you know batch data and we can test it we can take you know maybe 100 200 lines from our original data um without the target value and we can upload that as a csv file let the model do its work and it will give the user the results Putting this dashboard together is going to be quite a big job. My first thoughts were to basically maybe each task group creates a streamlit page, and then at the end we can come together and put all the pages together. Adding new pages to a streamlit app isn't difficult at all, but as long as we've got the code for each individual page, we can basically, you know, we can we we can put that together into one big solution. Um, the streamlit documentation gives us examples of how to actually put a page in there and um, how to upload a model and allow the the streamlit app to read the model and also it gives you you know um, some html templates that we can we can use um, however that is if it's hosted on our own website but streamlit streamlit allow you to host a web uh, host an app itself um, on on um, on their platform that's not a problem all you have to do is sign up um, we could also, I mean, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure of the free tier options that Streamlit have. I haven't checked for a, for a while, to be honest with you. Um, and if that, if, if it's very, if it's very limiting, um, we can use the hug and face um, deployments as well. We can build it into that. That won't be a problem. But they use Gradio, I believe. Um, so it'd be slightly different. But you know, we can come to that when it gets there. So I think over the next week, in and you know the. However long it takes with the model deployment, I think each group should be able to, to work on their page of the Streamlit app together um, and follow along the Streamlit app guidance and documentation. It makes it really easy. Um, they tell you how to, you know, to, to construct your local, um, local file architecture and you can run it locally before uploading as well to make sure everything is where it should be. Um, you, you know, you can use um, the EDA that we've done for the model building for the vehicle analysis. You can save all the graphs and charts that we've done and some of the note, notes we've made about it. And we can save them down as images, uh, JPEG images, and we can upload them into our file structure and put them into the um, Streamlit app. It's not that difficult. Retin has made a fantastic Streamlit app. Um, he shared it. Oh, was it Streamlit or was it on Heroku? I can't remember. But it's pretty much the, 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 the same fundamentals. And I'm sure um, I, I did originally ask Retton to be the, the, the lead on this, but, you know, he hasn't got the time to take full responsibility. But I'm sure if you reach out to Retton, um, he'll be able to give some points and, and, and help everyone 
build um, the streamless app as I, as I will as well. But um, the documentation, you know, it, like always, for example, he's been, you know, working himself and teaching him as he goes up, teaching himself as he goes along using tutorials. And, um, it, you know, he's created very, um, you know, a, a very good piece of work. Um, and I am sure the rest of you guys will be able to follow suit and follow the stream app tutorials and put something together and we can eventually join that up to, to, to give one solution. Um, the trickiest part will probably be, be the, the prediction part where we allow a user to upload a batch of files, um, you know, maybe a CSV file uh, with 100 or so lines, 200 lines of our original data without the target in there. And we can, you know, make predictions on that. That'll probably be the most tricky part about it. The rest of it is just basically a, a, a dashboard. Um, it would be, it might be a nice idea to um, redo our EDA graphs in Plotly, and that makes them interactive, which can be linked on Streamlit. So, so you know, the, the the user can can interact with them, hop, you know, move their mouse over the the um you know the the various parts of the the, the graphs, the plots, and and it gives them you know certain statistics and whatnot. Uh, the geospatial demo I did was in Plotly. Um, it was very basic. I uh, threw it together in about ten minutes uh, by reading one of the the, the tutorials, and um, you know it, it was it was easy to put together. So I think if we are going to you know make a dashboard with these with these images, I'd you know make them a bit more interactive. They don't all have to be interactive. Some of them speak for themselves. Um, you know, if you're just doing a count of how many female or male drivers there was. Don't really need that as being interactive but you know ones which maybe you know some of the time series ones that might be an idea to make them a bit interactive with pl plotly i don't know i'm just throwing out suggestions um it would be a good idea just experiment with it and, and we'll see what happens and we can put all that together but i would really encourage everyone to to log on to stream um streamlift make a an account and follow the documentation um and try and see if you can put just a simple page together which illustrates some of the, the observations we found. Um, we could, as I said, we could use all the graphs and the plots from the EDA, but also the notes that we've made. Um, I would supplement the graphs with those notes and some of the observations from the earlier part of the challenge. You know, interesting observations that we've made, like the, 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 especially around the vehicle, be, you know, vehicles that are most involved in accidents it contained within our data um, was seven years, things like that. Things like that, might, you know, will be able to, you know, raise some interesting questions and, you know, help people figure out what the data is about and what the state of the roads are like in in the UK. I think that's probably the best way forward. Um, it is a monumental task for one person, but if we spread it out and everyone, you know, chips in, makes a few pages, and we can just go over them and and take a look at what we've done and pick the best ones to include into our into our solution de deployment. Um, yeah, I think that's the the way we should move forward. Um, but we'll talk, you know, we'll talk about more more about that in, in Slack. I'll post some resources as always, the documentation to Streamlit, and I'll find some good examples. Um, I'm sure someone has already done something very similar to what we plan to do, um, possibly even using the same Department of Transport UK data as well. I'll I'll have a little research into that, and we can obviously. Um, I don't want to say the word steal, but we can certainly manipulate and and um, you know take a few you know take some inspiration from from their from their dashboards or, or whatnot or their analysis and and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think that's the way we can move forward. But for now, let's just focus on what we are here for, which is the um, basically the product of the past weeks of week of work in terms of model development. Um, we've got. Um, I think we'll start with the group one. Um, Always and Michael, you've been doing some fantastic work and shared your notebooks. Would you just like to um, explain um, the, the the sort of final result um, of, of your work? I've allowed you to share your screen, so um, if anyone wants to just start now, that'll be great. Sure, I'll I'll jump in. Um, uh, this is. Can everyone see the notebook? Is it up? Be good. Better? Yep. 
Am I sharing the full screen? Hold on. Yeah, you've been watching Ace Ventura, haven't you? Classic. Classic. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why it shared my whole screen instead of just the individual tab. Yes, watching Ace Ventura. Uh, sometimes you need a break from from data science. Yes, uh, you do. Yes, you do. So, um, uh, oh, Ace, Kevin, uh, you know, a few of us met uh, yesterday evening to kind of talk about where we're at with the model. Um, we had, uh, I think Wednesday, I had talked about um, my utilization of Smote and trying to, to determine uh, in the in the model, uh, we have a significant class imbalance and it's causing issues with our ability to kind of... Uh, uh, appropriately predict. Um, so last night I was trying to, uh, Richard provided me with the, uh, a, a parquet file that has the, the data through 2016. And I was going to use the data from 2011 to 2016, uh, to essentially per, as a validation set for the model after I've done all the training, uh, and, and testing. Um, and so I put together, this is a extremely cleaned up version. My notebooks occasionally get to be, because I just do so much testing and changing in them that they get a little bit messy. Uh, this is an extremely cleaned up version. I'm just bringing in the accident time series parquet, which is all the data from 2005 till 2016. Um, I am cleaning up the, uh, the, the individual um, uh, features to make sure that we don't have any missing values. Uh, I'm getting rid of uh, uh, empty values, uh, uh, null values in the in the data set. Uh, I perform all of the same uh, trans uh, translations um, uh, encodings that were done in my previous notebooks, uh, changing date to a ob date object and pulling out month, changing time to uh, a date time object pulling out hour so forth and so on um then we go ahead and we encode everything and then after everything has been encoded i split off the data set into two different sets our test set which is going to be everything from the beginning until the year through the year 2010 and then our encoded validation set which is everything from 2010 afterwards. And then we drop the year access because that doesn't, that's that's not going to help us uh, determine accident severity. Uh, we do, we encode the categorical, the, the target variable just to ensure that it's set. And then we, uh, and then I went through, uh, split it up into our features and our target variable, and then run it through Smote, split it into a trained test set, and then we run it through a random forest classifier. Using Smote, the random forest classifier has a really high accuracy. It seems to be pretty good. Um, it's doing, you know, all of our scores, as you can see, are doing really well. Uh, it is really effective. However, here's where it falls apart. Uh, we take that validation set, we split off our uh, target variable, and then we run that validation set through our already trained uh, random uh, classifier, and we kind of fall on our face. Our, our accuracy score drops down to 80, and we fundamentally lose the ability to predict. Um, we're not like terrible at predicting serious. Uh, accidents uh collisions um but we are uh barely better than not even like we, we have we're back to being particularly terrible at predicting uh um fatal accidents um uh, unfortunately at this point in time i've kind of run up against uh i think and uh, oasis and i i kind of brought this up at the meeting that we had last night is that we've both tried several different things, uh, you know, undersampling, oversampling, synthetic oversampling, uh, you know, uh, like a couple different versions of synthetic uh, of synthetic oversampling. Like we've tried a whole bunch of things to try and deal with this imbalance. And I think one of the things that that 
we may need to consider, and I think that this is something that we saw in in the, the data when we were doing the EDA, is that there's a possibility that there's sufficient randomness in what causes a fatal accident uh, in terms of like what would I what would be used as an identifier that it's it's fundamentally going to be impossible to pull that out from just the background noise. So, uh, and the the reason that I say that is that when we looked at the data during the EDA portion, um, over time we saw that the total number of accidents was trending downwards, but the number of fatal accidents is almost uniform across the entire time span, which I think leads like leads me to at least consider the fact that maybe the reason for that is that essentially fatal accidents have reached a like a base state where like the things that are causing these are are random and they're not like they're not something that we can solve because if there was a spike that would be identifiable as something that we could address but there's no spikes there's no significant changes it seems to just be like you know many different small contributing factors but not any uniform contributing factors this also plays out in both uh oase and i have both seen when you do feature importance for any of these models the relative importance of any feature even if you've trimmed the features down the relative importance of any individual feature in predicting uh you know the the outcome is is low it, like is significantly less than five percent for any single feature and most of them are indifferentiable from 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 zero and so um i like i said i i'm not certain what the next step might be um and i'm hoping maybe rich that you have like a, a thought or maybe something else that we can try or something that we haven't tried um but uh, that's, I think, where where I'm at right now. Be right. Um, to say that you know, it's there doesn't seem to be a particular recipe for a fatal accident in our data. It does seem to, you know, it, it does sort of have a a. It's a noisy pattern that indicates a fatal accident. I think my so the next step would be, if I was working on this in real life, was to make a binary classification between serious and fatal, and see if you know you see if we can we can make a no tail of 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 that. Um, that's what I'd probably do. Just give all the severities as uh, the serious a zero and the fatals a one. And run a few binary class classifications on it, and just see if you know how the performance is between serious and fatal. And I'd do it in the same way we have. Um, maybe, maybe do it without any sort of um, um, uh, tag of feature balancing, and just leave it as is, and then also balance it and see how that runs. That's what I would probably do next, just to see. You know what the difference is because the slight it's overwhelming the the data set and to be honest the slight ones may you know as we've already discussed may not be you know the most important part of our of our model because at the end of the day if it's just a slight knock these things kind of happen all the time and i imagine that there's some that happening in car parks and things like that they're not really a danger to life where the serious and fatal ones will be um, so I would, I would, that would be my next step: is make a binary classification problem out of this with the serious and fatal accidents, and see how a model does that. Then, um, because you know, you remove the slight, you're reducing the data set, and you're also getting rid of a lot of noise as well. That will overwhelm any sort of uh, model. So yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably do that. Try a, a binary, you know, logistic regression, naive Bayes, and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Try it, try a few on them. Um, as a, as, a, as a binary classification, just to see what happens. 
Um, but you know, I think the insight that you've just mentioned in terms of this, it does seem to be quite, you know, the, the, the random occurrences, there doesn't see, to seem to be a certain recipe to lead to fatal accidents. That might, you know, render a, a legit, like a, a binary classification problem also um, completely pointless as well. But I think it's just nice to know. And, you know, mm -hmm. we can experiment with that. That's what I'd probably do. Whether it's right or wrong, who knows? We'll have to experiment so, with it. Uh, I mean, I think that there's certainly insight that can be gained from that. Um, yeah. But on that point, I do have like one one question. So mm -hmm. uh, let's assume that we that like essentially we throw away all the slight accidents and we're essentially just rerunning all the models on just the serious versus the fatal and making yep. this a binary classification that that simplifies the model. And it may actually be able to tease out possibly more more accurate uh, accuracy from the from the model. Uh, however, um, that in my in 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 my mind that renders this model fundamentally useless for predictive purpose because the data that would be coming in would include that third category and the model would be unable to handle yeah it could it couldn't be deployed at all yeah. yeah yeah i understand yeah definitely it wouldn't be one for production but i think it, it would be it's yeah, only for our own benefit, isn't yeah, it? For understanding, understanding point of view. Yeah, yep, absolutely. absolutely. Nope. Yep. Okay. I was just I just wanted to like see if maybe there was some other like thing that I was yeah. missing. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll I think that's what I'd do off the bat. In terms of what we can do, I'll have to have a little think about that. I'm not entirely sure at the moment, but I'm sure we'll be able to come up with something. But for the time being, I'd just try to uh, as a binary problem. Um and then we'll see if we can take it from there. I'll have to have a think about that. It's, um, yeah, but I, as you say, I agree. I agree with, with what you've observed. It does seem to be, is it too, is it too random to be, to be solved by machine learning? You know, it's one of them questions. It's, it can, you know, it's not going to, AI and ML, it's not going to fix everything. And this might be one of yeah. the problems it can't fix. We don't know. I mean, all, we, all we can do based on our EDA and what we've discovered, we can make certain recommendations about what, you know, what we think is the problem but will it be solved by ml who knows and from what we've what we're looking at at the moment it seems to be struggling because there is as you say a lot of noise i mean one of the things that i also have kind of looked at uh, th through this data set a little bit more or when you provided the the full like the 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 like 10 year time span as opposed to just the the like five year original time span that we have or seven year time span, whatever it was. Um, like uh, one thing that I noticed with this data set is that for, th there's a remarkable amount, like it's not, it, it doesn't feel particularly well gathered. Like, I feel like there's a lot of human error in the data collection around this because these these are i guess these are part of like you know police reports or accident reports that are being filed with the municipalities and so like there's a lot of things i actually um uh the original version i tried very quickly to um like just bring in the data the new data set and use just the data from the years past 2010 but i couldn't like the the time series data set that has all of the years and the original data set are not identical they're not actually the same and they don't contain the same information uh and they have like they have different like they, some of some of the features have different categories contained within them that are not uniform across both data sets and it's it's very weird like it's just a very strange data set and i think that one of the limitations of this data set like it may not be that the problem can't be can't be solved with machine learning it may just be that the problem can't be solved with machine learning with the data that we have available because it is like but you know i think in, in a real world scenario like one of my recommendations might be maybe we need to consider how data is being collected on this. Like if we want to have some actionable thing, like you can't, you know, 
data is the important part and yeah and that, i don't know it, it's it, it, it just it's a very it's a very weird problem uh, i think yeah. there was a question about uh whether we're applying synthetic sampling to the to the testing data too uh, no uh the only area that we're using that i'm using the synthetic uh data for is to train the model initially um and then i'm just using that like the second half of the data as test data to be um uh to be just that to be validation data um i uh, to to determine how accurate the the model is against data that it has never that it has truly never seen before um one thing that 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 smote does do and it and in a way it like uh I, I guess one way that I could, uh, I could smote, I guess, after my, like right here, I'm doing my train test split. Uh, I could try reversing this and do like split this and then do, uh, do smote after I've already done my train tests, uh, train test split so that the test data isn't getting I mean the, the the test data in the original setup isn't getting uh uh like um changed in any way shape or form but I, I don't know that that's going to have a significant uh impact on the overall yeah uh, Oasis is saying that he's also tried that I didn't think it would with machine learning modeling in 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 mind so yeah, yeah in a real life situation if you were working for uh, you know a comp company and you were a data scientist and you taken on a contract with the department of transport and that this was the data that they provided it would be recommended you know in terms of you know to make to make everyone's life easier a request would be put into to, to record this data in a certain way in a very uniform way which is the same every single time so it could be fed into a model that would be part of you know the whole the whole process to, to develop solutions um but that's you know it's just a dem you know a, a good demonstration of how real life data can be an absolute pain when you're trying mm -hmm. to do something like this and you know for, for this particular challenge we're seeing them real life struggles um but in real life, we would, yeah, as you say, Michael, we would make a suggestion to record data in a certain way that would be more helpful to us. Um, and the data engineers would 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 do that and it would make our life a lot easier. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, you know, it's, it, it's been really good work. And some of the insights that have come out of that is just, you know, demonstrating how, how difficult it is using real life data, no matter how much you clean it and cleanse it. Sometimes there just isn't a obvious sort of pattern that a model can recognize and, and learn from um so yeah i think the next steps though let's do a binary classification just for our own sort of understanding of what's happening in the data and then um we can think about other ways you know how we're going to put this into production can it be put into production um we don't know yet but i'll have to have a um, little think about you know different methods we could we could tackle um, but yeah, that was great, Michael. Absolutely fantastic work. Um, and I think everyone, you know, has contributed brilliantly to that. Um, oh, wait, so have you got anything to share that might be a little bit different or anything? Or it, you, you want to walk to your your notebook and, yeah, and yeah. see what you've done? Yeah, go ahead, share your screen. So... I'm just this mindful of time. We've got we've got six minutes, uh, seven minutes left. So um, I'll give you a shout okay. when we need to restart the channel. Yeah, I will try to go quickly. Over it. So this is where we left. Uh, I left. Uh, we left off in the previous meeting, and you told me to train a model only on important features. Uh, so I I tried to do that, um, and these are the top features. So and I tried to train a model around it. And it it does not improve improve it. Instead, it uh, it decreases the performance of the model. So then I try to apply different uh, imbalance uh, technique handling imbalance data techniques. So first thing I do this is this is uh, yeah first thing that I did is uh, I merge the 
serious and fatal classes and then i scaled the data and then i uh, uh, i um, i just implemented a simple random forest model around it and as we can see it is not performing well so i tried uh, different techniques of uh, handling the imbalanced data so first i tried uh, under sampling and uh, and we can see that uh, it is somewhat better than what we had originally uh, in the precision and recall uh, trade off but uh, and we can see true fall and true uh, negative counts so it's somehow better but it's not good enough to rely on uh, i also tried uh, over sampling and uh, it's uh, better than the original data but still uh, not good enough and then i tried easy in ensembler so it's the same thing it's better than the, uh, the original model but uh, there's nothing that we can uh, rely on at this point and this is another technique adoptive synthetic sampling uh, i've read about it and it said that it is like a simplified version of the smart uh, technique so it is performing pretty bad uh, comparative to the other um, techniques that I've used. And sim uh, similarly, it goes for SMART. Um, then I tried to apply the same techniques on the data, but this time I did not try, I did not uh, scale my data. No, I did not do any feature scaling. Uh, so the one thing that that's uh, to notice here is that if you don't scale the data, the rest of the the, uh, the imbalance techniques are performing almost the same. But if we don't scale the data, then the the smart and the um, adaptive synthetic sampling uh, in, uh, technique in, improves the, in performance. Uh, so this is the first one is uh, scaled data. The second one is I tried it to do with unscaled data, and then this is the third notebook. Is I tried to uh, do it. Um, I did not merge the serious and fatal classes, and I tried to apply the same uh, imbalance techni techniques on it. So yeah, it's that there is nothing good enough that we we can rely on at this point. So what I think. Uh, what I am trying to do next is that there are two di different uh, extension of the smart technique. One is smart to make, and one is smart in. And I will try this, uh, but I don't think uh, like if all of these techniques are not performing well, then I don't think that these will make any significant uh, improvements in the model. So the only thing that we are left with is maybe we can go back to the feature engineering and maybe try uh, try extracting new features uh, from the old features and which will con which can contribute to the predictions uh, in a positive way so that's the only the only uh, suggestion that i've got from this point onwards uh, other than that everything that i had in my mind i i have tried to apply it and nothing worked out well it's Michael's, isn't he? Um, yeah. Struggling to to get any sort of pattern recognition out of the, out of our data to separate the classes very well. Um, but yeah, I would, you know, as Michael will try try a, a serious and fatal binary classification, see if we can pull any insight of how how the models not not how the models working, but to see if there is, a, you know, a, we're able to dif differentiate. On, on the serious and fatal and see what happens. Um, obviously that's, you know, as we said, it's just for our own understanding. Um, but yeah, oh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's great work. Great work. It'll be interesting to see the new smoke techniques as well. Fingers crossed they can give us, you know, some better performance, but yeah, I think uh, going back to feature engineering and pre-processing would be the logical step forward. Um, if not in real life, we would say, listen, this data, the way you collect it isn't good for us. So we'll have to, you know, come up with some different ways to collect this data to, to make machine learning viable. Um, but yeah, yeah, great work, great work. 
um, I think uh, it the 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 point that you mentioned that we should uh, train a binary classifier on the serious and fatal accident. It might also turn out uh, to be a better. I, there is a chance for it to perform well. Then, uh, so yeah, I will try. Yeah. On on the on the flip side to that, I think, you know, when when does a serious when does a serious collision become a fatal one? Where's the sort of cutoff, if you know what I mean? What sort of information that we've got in our data that can that can define the difference between the two? That's what we're we're, we're wondering about, um, because it probably would be a very grey area, because I imagine you know a fatal accident is going to be serious, and a serious one, it, it, you know. Not every there's not going to be a, it could be a serious accident, but you know the chance might be no one no one you know it's not fatal, so it, it it's trying to define that line between the two, and I think we'd probably get a better understanding. With Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Can everyone hear me fine? Yeah, cool. I won't be able to go on camera today. Um, I've, I'm waiting for a new laptop, so I'm using my desktop computer, and uh, it hasn't got a webcam, unfortunately. We'll just give it a couple of minutes. We'll give it one more minute and then we're cracking. Okay, then I think we uh, might as well start. Um, thanks for coming. We've uh, we've had a couple of days now just to think about the the, the modeling side of things. Um, I've sent in a couple of tutorials in terms of like the the um, time series analysis. There's a couple of different sorts of models we could use. Um, 
I'm not sure if anyone's attempted anything. I'm trying to put together something um, in my spare time at the moment, um, just in, in terms of the time series analysis. And, as, you know, last time Michael um, was, you know, running a couple of, of, of quick models on the data he had, um, as was always, um, and I've had a couple of messages on Slack just to talk about, you know, the various different methods of, um, of feature engineering. Um, a couple of people, a couple of people, are, I believe, are still are working on the feature engineering, which is absolutely fine because it is an iterative process. Um, we can, you know, create a couple of features, um, maybe, you know, put them to the test and see how it works out. And if it doesn't work out very well, if it's not effective, we can go back over it again um, and, and adjust the, the, the features. So, you know, if, if you are working on feature engineering, don't worry, you're not behind. It's just, this is part of the process. Now, um, the feature engineering and the modeling go hand in hand. Um, there's a million different things we can try. Um, and it is, you know, it can be one giant rabbit hole that we can, we, we fall down. But, um, you know, we, we, we'll, uh, you know, there's plenty of things to discuss in terms of the modeling. Um, is, it, does anyone at the moment have anything that they want to share? Um, any work they've done on either feature engineering or modeling? I'll just allow um, people to share the screen. Um, always, you can share your screen. Go ahead. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Uh, okay. So I've been working uh, on the feature engineering of the accident and vehicle data merged on the accident index. So I, I will just go through the few things. This is this is the accident and uh, accident data and vehicle data uh, merge on the accident index. Uh, feature engineering of uh, feature pre-processing engineering. So it's almost uh, uh, similar to the previous notebook that I've shared uh, just with a couple of changes. So in this notebook, you, we can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, missing values and columns. So what I did is that um, Columns that had more than 75% missing values, uh, these columns, I um, dropped them. I dropped these columns completely. So then we are left with this and then the rest, I, 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 I uh, yeah, I implemented this column transformer. So in this, I am uh, categorical features, I'm imputing them with data missing and the numerical features, I'm imputing them with their mean value and the target variable or uh, accident severity it, it, uh, it is encoded uh, ordinal encoder. Uh, so this is this is after the imputation and and this is the final data set and this is. Uh, this is after the after scaling the data set and then I tried to implement the random forest on this and uh, on, on this uh, data set, on this uh, notebook too. This is the merged notebook and this is the notebook that I presented uh, during the previous uh, meeting. So one thing to note here is that uh, then the notebook that I pre uh, presented uh, during the last um, uh, meeting session, it 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 returns eighty five percent accuracy, which we talked about in the previous meeting, and this one is returning eighty seven percent accuracy. Uh, and then yeah, uh, I was trying to yeah, this is uh, the important the few features that are contributing the most most to the to the model feature importance. And these are the uh, these are the features and this is how much each feature is contributing to the model. And then I was trying to plot the ROC curve. It, uh, it generates an error, but uh, this is, this is 
and this is i think it is half not not completely compiled but there is uh, one thing that we can see between these two curves that if we look at this curve you can we can see that um it is uh, uh, cornered, a cornered a sharp sharp corner and this one is a bit round and the other thing to notice here is that this one is flat and this one is uh, uh curved so my my guess is that this is the uh, curve of the um, uh, slight accidents and this one is uh, of the series series accidents so and the third one i guess it, it's not even plotting the fatal one so so the one thing to notice here is that this mod, the the merge mod in the merge notebook the cs curve is more more rounded than the, than the other one so this means that if we if we combine the fatal and serious together then um, maybe we can get even a better curve uh, right here so yeah that's all and that's where i am right now. that's cool yeah um have you have you tried to uh, attempt and balance in the the um classes yet or is is that to come uh no cool. i will i will do it here i will do it to, today i will yeah, yeah. upload the notebook yeah, yeah. Cool. So the, it's interesting that the the important features, um, you know, there's only what maybe just above five percent of importance on on some of these on some of these features, which is quite interesting. Um, with the featured important um chart you've got there, I would try yeah. and you know we'll try it before and after you deal with the unbalanced classes, but all the the features give a you know an importance um of over five percent you know five percent or close to five percent so all them peaks that you can see it would it would be interesting to try and just isolate those features and run and train just a them features on, on them features. yeah 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 that'll be yeah. probably the next yeah, step um and we can do that before you balance the classes and after as well just to see how that affects the the performance um at the moment um, Michael mentioned it last last time. Um, I think you know with an unbalanced class, the prop, the most important metric that we'll probably it's be precision. looking for yeah, is yeah. precision. So it'd be interesting to see if you change your metrics into precision, what kind of performance it's outputting then. And once we balance the features, we can take a look. We can compare then the accuracy, the precision, and the F1 score to see what what happens. Um, and also, we're just selecting. The most important features we can see how that affects uh, affects the model. Um, I imagine you know we've got quite a number of features there. Um, you know, forty eight features. Yeah. So yeah. it's you know it is a massive source of data set for the model to digest. Um, and model you know machine learning models love simplicity. So I imagine putting those important features just together. Uh, so what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe, or maybe six. If we just take the first six, the highest peaks, um, it'd be interesting to see how that yeah, goes. I, I was, uh, this code is from a tutorial that I was following our data cool. came on a data game. So they also did the same thing after this. That they yeah, picked yeah. Up that important. And it actually increased the accuracy in that case. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I will, I will take it into consideration. I will, I will do it. Yeah, because the feature importance, I mean, what it tries to describe is what, what bits of our data set, you know, tell the story um, to, to get to the, the, the target um, value. Um, what I would do as well, just to give it, a, if it's possible, just to give it a bit more sort of explainability. Um, once you've, you know, you've done your, your sort of feature importance, you've gathered those important features as well. I would then map back in the index um, column yes. names and yeah, map yeah, them yeah. back I in know. so we can see what, what they are. <laughs> and, you know, some of them might be very surprising, but it might be also quite obvious, but it is possible if you save the, um, if you, if you pull the the, the column names in a yeah, list, yeah, yeah, you can remap them in. 
Yeah, okay. I I have them here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sport, cool. I, I, will, yeah, I will do it. Perfect. Perfect. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really fantastic work. I mean, you know, the tutorials that you've been following have been quite robust and it's a good sort of example of, you know, how effective um, tutorials can be. And you've got some very important work there, which is quite standard to a, a, a machine learning sort of pipeline. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fantastic. We just have to, you know, do some more experimentation with various different features and whatnot. Um, and I think we'll, we'll have something quite strong. Um, has anyone got any questions about Oasis Way? Or any, uh, any suggestions to help them along? No? Cool. Very good work, always. Um, has anyone else got anything to share? Any developments or any sort of insights that you've, you've, you've discovered? Uh, I have done some uh, balancing, class balancing, if we cool. want to, people want to take a look at that. Yep, definitely. Uh, let me go ahead and share this real quick. Uh, can everyone see? I'm assuming that yep. we need to zoom in a little bit. Yeah, just a touch. Oh, go there we go. There That's there. perfect. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to apologize that it's it's a, a mess, um, but uh, this is essentially where the um, where I started to try a couple of different things for imbalancing. So. Um, Scikit Learn actually has a library that's associated with it called uh, IMB Learn, which is for is actually based around imbalanced uh, 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 classification problems, um, and they have a whole bunch of uh, built-in uh, you know functions uh, that you can access. Uh, one of them being a random undersampler. I tried that. Um, the default behavior is that it just uh, attempts to uh sample all of the classes that are present equally so that they match the minority class uh which for us would be fatal accidents um unfortunately when it does this the sample size is decreased so much that the accuracy of the model actually goes down because there's not there's insufficient information to uh to actually uh, accurately predict on it anymore. So we went from about an 85% accuracy overall down to approximately a 40% uh, accuracy, um, uh, more or less across the board, 40 to 50% accuracy, uh, which is a not a not a great uh, uh, change. Um, however, uh, for oversampling, I decided to go uh, with um, smote, um, which synthetically creates uh, instances of the minority classes. So in our case, uh, it generates a whole bunch of artificial versions of both fatal and um, uh, and serious accidents, and then adds those to the data set, which actually, uh, increases the overall size of the of the data set. Um, so we increase, we split it again, and then we run our series of tests. And this actually, we start to see, uh, we get some significant increases. We get 86% uh, on decision tree classifier. But the, the real area where we get value is that our positive predictive value for fatal accidents has increased to 95% at this point in time, yeah. which means that we have gotten very good at predicting fatal accidents, which is what we would like to be able to, to do. Um, uh, additionally, uh, the random forest classifier gets us a 90, almost 94% accuracy overall and a nearly perfect uh, positive predictive value for um uh fatal accidents at at 90 99% uh it is it is getting to be very good at it there may be some possibility now because of the way that the artificial um data is being added that we are overfitting um but i have not uh explored that as of right now um this 
these two tests I just did on just the accident data itself. I also tried running um, this test on the accident data with the vehicular data um, merged in. This yet again caused uh, just a slight increase in our overall predictive uh, value with our, our best accuracy being about 95% and actually our positive predictive value for fatal accidents being, uh, it is reading as 1.0, but it's really uh, not quite that, but it is very close. Uh, out of approximately 67, uh, thousand uh, predicted fatal accidents, it only messed up on 300. So that's a, a pretty, pretty good. Um, uh, so looking at that, the decision tree classifier seems to be after running several of these, I mean, uh, the random forest classifier seems to be maintaining the most accuracy. It also happens to take the longest uh, for all of the models that I have tried. Um, uh, pulling that out and then uh, parsing the data. I was doing this right before the meeting started. I wanted to actually start looking at like feature importance and see what we can pull out. There do seem to be some features that have some significant importance. Uh, however, what they are, I, I didn't even, I haven't, this, graph is useless um, yeah. it will, it will be better <laughs> it will be better in the future um the, the it is it is fundamentally unusable at this point in time but um it, it does look like there is some um it does look like using smote is providing with us with some uh at least some marginal value um one thing that uh i'm i'm going to attempt doing is i'm going to attempt uh Doing a train, uh, essentially starting over with a new, with a fresh uh, uh, random tree classifier model and doing uh, a train test and a validation set uh, and see uh, if that has a, a different outcome. Uh, another thing that I was wondering is, I think Rich, you had mentioned, I, I haven't gone looking for it yet, um, but uh, this accident data only covers through 2010. Do we have accident data which covers further into the future? Yes, Is... we do. Um, I okay. Yeah, I will. Um, I think there's still a link um, within the time series data. They have the data from 2005 to 2017, I believe. Um, I will DM you that on Slack so you can plug that in. Um, Perfect. Cool. It was only because, you know, for the predictive model, what we wanted to experiment with was different sort of dates and different, you know, maybe build the model to predict on the 2005 to 2010 data and then use a completely different year as a test set and see if the distribution is the same and the model still performs. That was the idea behind it. But yeah, you know, from what you've you've the results you found um it would be interesting to see it just you know with the whole you know till 2017 data um yeah i i actually just want to use it as a, uh, essentially as a validation set yeah, what i'd yeah, like to do cool. is 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 use like 2011 through 2015 to provide like this is data that the model hasn't seen that hasn't been uh you know uh smote uh, we haven't yeah. created any synthetic versions of it and so i think it would be interesting to see how the model performs on data that it hasn't seen uh whatsoever absolutely um uh but uh, so uh some interesting um you know things here there are a couple of other um i didn't try just uh i didn't try just normal over selection which essentially just uh, you know, duplicates the existing minority group, uh, minority classes. Um, I didn't, I didn't try that because I thought that, uh, at least with Smote, we're getting some variability in it, which I think helps to prevent, well, helps in some ways helps to prevent, um, uh, overfitting. But, uh, I think with the sheer number of, uh, uh essentially, uh, randomly generated uh, minority class 
uh, selections that are needed for this data set, uh, I think that it may be hard to avoid overfitting uh, just kind of in, in, in general. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, if we plot, if we plot some some learning curves, I'm, I'm sure we'll be able to spot it, no problem. Um, in terms of your bar graph uh, with the feature importance, I just, um, you know, there is, you know, a, a handful of, of features that seem to be very significant um, in terms of explainability to, to the target function, uh, the target uh, feature. So I would just put a cutoff in that bar graph to say like anything over, you know, one percent or, or you know what have we got what are we dealing with there yeah so we've got a few, yeah yeah but i mean I, th I think another thing it's hard to parse out right now uh, and yeah, i don't know yeah. if you can see it on your screens but like the one of the interesting things that i'm seeing is that some of these uh some of these features in the middle here are like makes and models of cars yeah and i find it interesting that they're like even though those spikes are very small comparatively to other makes and models like there's only like like this entire area here is going to be all car makes there's only like 10 car makes that seem to make up any sort of significant difference in terms of feature importance and so that like i'm gonna I, i'll i'll see what i can't do and see what i can't can't peel out of out of the data out of the out of what i've done so far and, and get get a little bit of more information but um yeah uh, yeah that's the thing you would you would find you would i find that quite surprising because you would associate you know intuitively bigger and faster cars to be involved in and in, in, you know to to give us an indication of what kind of accidents they've been in so yeah it is quite a um a counterintuitive sort of observation yeah. and it is very it, interesting yeah, it, it, it may also be, I mean, one of the, like the, we, unfortunately, I, we don't have, uh, you know, I, I haven't found the data to, to kind of verify against, but yeah. like, like, if there's just more voxels on the road, you would assume that voxel would just show up more frequently yeah. and thus yeah. would be a more important feature because it's in more accidents, which means it's probably in more fatal accidents as well. Yeah. And so there, like some of it is, uh, some of it is it might be actual important, and some of it is it may just be statistically important, which is yes. not yeah. not real world important all the time. Yeah, so. definitely. No, it's really good, really um, good work. I didn't, I, you know, smoke is very powerful, and we can see that you know the the, the randomly generated data it provides is you know it is it. it it does generate it in between the sort of scaled values that we've we've done, um, and it does seem to be very effective. Um, yeah, but it would be it would be cool to see if we can we can identify if there's any overfitting um, with the learning curves. I think it's the that's probably the easiest easiest way to see it, just to see how the models are learning. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest as well um, try running it through XGBoost. Um, it is quite computationally heavy. And are you are you doing this off your own system or are you using Colab or Kaggle? Uh, I'm using my own my own computer. Cool. Um, if um, you've got a powerful enough GPU, um, I would set the uh, parameter for the XGBoost to use the GPU and just see if um, I think it's GP, GPU hist. I think the parameter is. You can use that to, to basically um, yeah G, GPU ID minus one. Is that yeah? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, mine. I have mine set up to currently. It, it is using my GPU. Yeah. What um, model? What model GPU do you have? Uh, RTX twenty uh, Nvidia RTX twenty eighty nice. Ti. Yeah. Um, running. It's it's beefy enough that it, it makes a difference. Cool. Cool. Um. um yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe Kaggle um have updated their uh, free um GPU systems, and we can and you can actually have two Nvidias. Um, I think mm -hmm. the A A one thousands or A two thousands, you can have both of them running on right. it. So it might be in. I mean, I don't know whether or not they're more powerful than your GPU because yours is quite a quite a beast. Um, so you know, it might be worth just running running a particular section of that on on the Kaggle three one and see if it makes see if it reduces the the time or you know has any effect on the accuracy or, or whatever. It's just worth the experiment. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think you know, I, I'm not entirely sure whether they are more powerful than yours, but yeah it's cool yeah um yeah so uh that's more or less what i've come with. does anyone does anyone else have any questions about what i did uh or 
or maybe how even necessarily how I did it, just in case anyone needs any clarification. If you could share your notebook into the Slack, people can take a look and try and run it on their own system or in um, in, in Google Colab or whatnot. But yeah, it's fantastic uh, work that. I'll reopen it. I'll re-upload it into Colab. Cool. I had to pull. I had to pull it out because yeah. it actually runs slower on Colab than it does yeah, on my yeah. local computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, that's the thing. I, I've. I've I've got rid of my old work laptop because I'm getting a new job. Um, so they're sending me out a new laptop, and it's a Dell Precision 15, and it's got a 32 gigabyte A3 A NVIDIA A3000 mm -hmm. GPU for machine learning, and mm -hmm. I can't wait to get all of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I can I'll try and run some bits and bobs myself. I should I should have it this week. Um, so it'll be interesting to see you know how how it affects on on your workbook. Oh, Ace, you raised your hand. Uh, yeah, so um, I was doing some research on the, the vehicles that were involved in the accidents. And if we run uh, the analysis uh, on the vehicles, um, we, we can see that the, the top vehicles that are involved, in the in top number of accidents by the vehicle that are involved in accidents are Reynolds and uh, Vauxhall. So, um, can I uh, let me share my screen for you? So, I was doing some research on it and I found out that these are the most common cars in the UK. So, you can see that Vauxhall and Renault Clio, these are both present in the like these are uh, in, uh, in a high quantity in, uh, in used in high quantity in the UK. And these cars are uh, uh, these cars are known for this unresponsive brake. This this is this is uh, for yeah. This is for Renault Clio unresponsive braking. These are uh, these cars. Are, I, I I first of all I don't I don't know too much about cars because uh, I am not quite into it. But this is all I found on the internet. So. Yeah. I did yeah, have I did have a Renault Clio as my first car, and I can confirm, yeah, the braking isn't the best. Um, yeah. But yet this 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 in this kind of research, this will help our solution. We can you know we can say based on the accident data that we have between two thousand and five, two thousand and seventeen, or whatever. You know, we we found that Vauxhalls and Renaults, um, it, specifically the Clio, has, be, has been involved in most accidents according to our data set. We've got supplemental material that we've researched and found that, you know, there is reports that the Clio is known for having a issue with um, a stop time, which may, you know, I don't think it's something that we can test, but, you know, it, it is definitely worth noting within our, with, within our solution. Um, all this kind of research is valuable. Um, it gives explainability to, to our observations and all the EDA we've done on the vehicle data set. This allows us to make, you know, educated guesses of what the issue may be. So, you know, it, it is, it is valuable, um, valuable. I was actually looking for the reason that uh, you asked in the few uh, previous uh, meeting during the previous meeting that why are cars of eight seven spiking so much in the accidents. So I was actually going after that, and the yeah, this is what I found in the research. So this is another vehicle, uh, Punto. I guess it is. It is also in the top um, vehicles involved in the accident. And this guy was just sharing a story about it. Hey, while returning back, a big traffic jam, and but the issue immediately. Uh, but Punto proved I again faced the same issue, and this I faced it four times in a row. So. It's, it's the same thing. There was an instance I could have banged on my kind of, but luckily applied handbrake. So it's uh, the same thing, the like yeah. breaking, breaking issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, this is, I just wanted to share it. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's, um, I think at the top of my head, there's a, there's an English website called Witch, and its purpose is to basically um, rate products. And it does give a list of, I'm sure it gives a list of um, most unreliable vehicles. 
and uh, it you know it's on it's in terms of having breakdowns and things like that but it's also about uh, problems with braking steering and things like and, and and other issues that may impact the amount of accidents that that you know that particular car is is, is being in according to our data so if you go to i think it's witch.co.uk and just search for um you know uh, most unreliable top unreliable cars or um top dangerous cars or, or something like that and i believe they'll be they'll they don't just take sort of anecdotes kind of thing they actually do the research into it and and you know do a, a long-term study of, of i mean i suppose it's not the greatest study because it, 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 it is you know a collection of anecdotal data but they put it all into one place so instead of you scouring the internet for individual stories they already have done that and put it together um you know over five hundred thousand people who have that particular car and what their most common issues have been um so yeah witch.co.uk i'd take a look at that um, and see if we can pull it you know see if we can match any of the, the reviews on there with the, the the vehicles that appear in our data uh yeah it, it would it will be helpful yeah, yeah i will check it yeah that's the thing i mean we can with part of the process of data, you know a data scientist and a machine learning engineer if you're working for a client you need to explain you know what you found in the data and if you can back that up with proper research that you've you've found by you know um uh, reputable bodies it makes our sort of insights a lot more powerful and we can you know go to the client and say you know we we've got these three vehicles that seem to you know be involved in the most accidents between this particular time period we've done external research and we found that out that you know two of these vehicles in our top three have known um stopping ability um maybe you know there's there's the known for having these particular faults we can't say with 100 percent certainty that this is the reason why they're involved in most accidents but it seemed it seemed to be a smoking gun and it might you know i the chances are it does reflect um on the accident data it's definitely worthwhile compiling them and if you could always just keep a keep a, a sort of list of, of links you've used and what observations you've made and we can sort of make you know a, a support and documentation for our dashboard in terms of the the, the you know to go with the, the vehicle eda analysis definitely it's great work but yeah michael you're modeling fantastic um some really good insights into smoke and how powerful it actually is um i think from you know that point of view where we can predict with a very good accuracy for the fatal accidents if we're not if if it's not overfitting you know we're, we're in a very very good position um, if it is all overfitting we can deal with that um, in a, a number of different ways, we can, you know, we can do some more experimentation. But, you know, for the first sort of crack of the whip, fantastic work. We're in a really good position. Um, has anyone got anything? Has anyone been working on the time series analysis at all? Um, I'm going to be helping out on that one. I've uploaded a couple of um, uh, notebooks on my GitHub just with the Arima and... Um, the LSTMs. I haven't plugged in our data, but I've tried to keep it as as simple as possible in their notebook, so anyone can can take a uh, take a look. If no one has worked on it, don't worry about it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try and get something done through this week for Saturday, just to show you an example of of, of what we're doing. But um, yeah, I think for the in in terms of the predictive model, fantastic job fantastic um and you know everyone's brought some very valuable insights to the table and um you know michael's work is fantastic always you know you know following along the, the the tutorials and learning as you go it's you know it seems that you've you've come leaps and bounds since starting the project and it's really good work so you should be proud of yourself definitely um okay has anyone got any other insights that they'd like to to share with the group Or any questions for anything that we've seen today? No? Okay, I don't think I've got much to share. Um, as I say, I'll prob I've, I've just uploaded a couple of um, templates into my GitHub and I've shared them in the Knowledge Center. Um, I haven't had a chance to take a look at the TSNE analysis. Um, I've just as I say, I've, I've had to give a laptop back to the government kind of thing, so I haven't I haven't had a chance um, 
but I will have something for Saturday, hopefully, and we can just talk about you know what effect and you know observe our data in a high dimension. Cool. Well, if no one has anything to share or if you don't have any questions, I think we'll leave it there because we're running out of time anyway. Um, as always, I'll upload this video to YouTube and uh, Michael and always if you can share your new versions of your notebooks with the group in the knowledge share, sharing section, it'd be great for everyone to take a look and, you know, follow your process, if that's okay. And yet, yeah, Levan, yeah, please do share your vehicle data notebook. Um, but thanks, guys. We'll leave it there then. Short and sweet. I'm looking forward to Saturday. Good work. Thanks very much, everyone. I'll see you soon.